welcome to Commissioner's Corner. I'm your host, Lois Leonard, and I have a question for you. Did you know that our city streets have over 35,000 trees? And another 125,000 grow in our parks and open spaces. Boston has 217 playgrounds, fields and parks, two golf courses, 75 game courts, and the list goes on. Someone has to be responsible for taking care of these resources. And today, we've asked our Commissioner of Boston Parks and Recreation, Christopher Cook, to join us and let us know how he keeps these spaces clean, green, safe, and accessible. Commissioner, thank you so much for talking with us today. Well, thank you very much. I couldn't be happy to be here. I'll say someone has to be responsible, but I certainly <laughs> can't take credit for it. All the credit goes to the hardworking men and women of the Boston Parks and Recreation But Department. when things go poorly, then oh, that's absolutely. I will take all the responsibility <laughs> when it goes bad, but when it goes good, I want to make sure that the people who are actually doing awesome. it are getting credit. Well, tell us a little bit about your work history in Boston that led to your appointment as uh, commissioner. Well, I was very fortunate. Uh, so uh, prior to this role, I was actually the director of arts, tourism, and special events. Um, and that, that position is actually split up into two offices now because uh, one of the first things that uh, Mayor Walsh did when he came in with his administration is he wanted to elevate the arts in the city of Boston. So he actually created a cabinet level arts position. So there's now an office of arts and culture and then he split that off at the office of special events. I was very fortunate uh, given my background to, to go over on an interim basis over to parks and recreation because we were heading into the summer season which was so busy with different special events. Um, and I've been there since. So I've been very fortunate to be at such a, a historic and a really great department. Okay, now just so you're prepared, later I'm, I want to ask you what your which park is your favorite. Okay. So um, just get prepared for that. One, I will. Okay? I'm, I'm ready right. for it. But meanwhile, tell us how do you take care of all those trees? Well, I tell you what, there, there's a lot of street trees in the city of Boston. I mean, I think our, our last count, which is really just an estimate, is well over 35,000. Uh, we just uh, contracted with a, a partnership with the University of Vermont to do an assessment of our tree canopy. And it looks like we're going to be coming in around 27, 28 uh, percent tree canopy in the city. Uh, that means we have a lot of work to do. We actually would like to increase the camp canopy if possible because tree trees have an enormous amount of benefits. Uh, first off, not only do they, they process a lot of CO2, obviously, for everyone involved, uh, they're incredibly helpful with the heat island effect. Uh, some of our neighbors are neighborhoods get really, really hot in the summer. The more trees there are, that helps with that. Also, it's a, it's a little known fact that it actually extends the pavement life. A well-treated street uh, really? the pavement actually lasts longer because of the temperature differential okay. on the streets, and it also processes a lot of stormwater. So street trees are enormously beneficial to the city. So we actually have to, I think, be more aggressive about finding locations to, to plant them in. But we actually re we rely a lot on the public uh, for the care of street trees. We use the 311 system to identify trees uh, that are potential hazards that need to be removed. Uh, 311 also lets us know when there might be a tree in stress and actually needs some pruning or needs some care. Um, so without the public's partnership in this, uh, we'd be nowhere. We don't have 35,000 employees to go monitor each tree. So the public plays a vital role in the stewardship of the canopy. Well, the amount of money that you must need in order to take care of all of your facilities, it must be tremendous. So how do you think you're doing in that department? I think we're doing very well. Mayor Walsh, uh, as well as the City Council, has uh, expanded our budget um, his first three years in, in office. Um, and we're, we're very, very fortunate to be the recipient of that. In addition to that is it's not okay for us to take additional taxpayer money if we're not looking for efficiencies. So we're also looking for ways to uh, be good stewards of those funds as they become available, um, whether that's smarter contracting or different services that we're trying to providing. What we're finding from people is that with the increased uh, population in Boston, our parks are busier than ever. And with that busyness comes greater expectations, things people want to see uh, recycling, people want to see more splash pads, people want to see uh, better different features in some of our parks. And so we want to make sure that as we make investments, we're, we're making them in a way that they're sustainable and uh, that our budget can control them. I was walking through Franklin Park recently mm -hmm. and I, it seems to me, and I hope I'm correct here, the sidewalks seem a little nicer? They're much nicer, <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's one of the, again, it's all the credit goes to the mayor of Boston. Um, 
the mayor identified very early on in a capital plan that we had that every year um, we had roughly two hundred thousand dollars set aside for Franklin Park Pathways, and Franklin Park is our is our largest park. Uh, you know, it's nearly oh, I didn't know yeah, that. it's nearly five hundred acres. It's arguably the most important natural asset that the city of Boston owns, and two hundred thousand dollars every year um, does not get you very far no. on those pathways, and so. What he said is, well, what would, what would it take to make a major impact? And we said about $5 million. And we're three quarters of the way through that $5 million initial pathway investment. Uh, and it's really transformed the walking experience there. A lot, we find that a lot more people are using it for walking, a lot more people are using it for jogging. It's actually creating a more welcoming experience for, for visitors to the park as well. So we're excited about that. But we're not going to stop there. We're in the middle of a Franklin Park um, uh, study to to open up the American Legion side and the Canterbury Street side of the park to make sure that there's another entrance there for the growing population in Eastern Rosendale and High Park so that they have access to this great natural asset. And of course, the mayor's also allocated $28 million from the, the sale of the Winthrop Square Garage to Franklin Park, um, which would kick off another master plan process. So uh, Franklin Park's best days are ahead of it. And there's other par uh, parks uh, due to come on board to have their sidewalks fixed. Oh yeah, not just the yeah. sidewalks. I mean, we have a very robust capital plan. One of the parks that we're very excited about is uh, Smithfield in, in Alston. Um, that's a major uh, recreational uh, sports uh, facility. Um, that's gonna be completely renovated and we're doing that in partnership um, with Harvard University. Uh, the focus here is to really maximize philanthropic and private dollars with the city's capital budget. And a great example of that is uh, in the South End Lower Roxbury Carter Playground. That's a partnership with Northeastern. It's going to transform Carter Playground to the tune of $26 million. Uh, so it's going to be one of our premier fields. So any opportunity we have like that to, to partner up with somebody to maximize our dollars, uh, the mayor wants to make sure that we take full advantage of that. Parks First is very mm -hmm. important and near and dear to your heart, a, a mission, if you will. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the importance of it? Yeah, I, 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 what goes into it is very complex, but the message is very simple, which is parks are, are one of the first opportunities that we have to address issues around accessibility, around equity, and, and frankly, environmental stewardship in our neighborhoods. And so the idea is that Parks First access equity and excellence. First off, we want to make sure that people have great access to wonderful green spaces in their city. Uh, we want to make sure there's an equity in how those facilities are taken care of and how they're distributed, how the money for those facilities are distributed. And then the third part is really about this environmental stewardship component, excellence. We want to make sure that there's an excellence in design and an excellence in uh, maintenance uh, responsibilities at those parks and so that we're really good stewards whether it's uh, recycling water when we can when we have the ability taking care of storm water when we have the ability making sure that we expand the recycling program as much as we can making sure that these spaces are clean and safe so access equity and excellence and I think our capital budget and also our operations budget that the mayor has put forward in front of the city council reflects those values. Um, as far as access, uh, I read a statistic and, uh, that says in the city of Boston, 98% of our residents have um, less than a 10 minute walk to, to a park. That's right. It's, That's phenomenal. No, it's really, really good. Tell and me, it, there's no other city that can do that. There's one other. <laughs> yeah, no, there's one other. It's a great city too. It's San Francisco. Okay. Um, we'll let them have that. We like San Francisco. I, I, I will say, we, we love San Francisco. In fairness, they do round up a little bit and yeah. they're 90, they're 99%. So okay. we'll, we'll, we'll catch up to them soon. But it's actually a trust for public land ranking and something we're very, very proud of. Uh, what's important, though, is that there's only real value to that statistic, the idea that 98% of our residents are within a 10-minute walk to a park. There's only real value in that statistic if that park is a good park. Yeah. And so that's where the park's first message comes in. Yeah, everyone has the availability of a park. And is there an equity in how that park is taken care of? We'll make sure that no matter what neighborhood uh, a kid lives in, that they're having a valuable experience when they get to that green space. There must be um, obviously new equipment, um, new uh, options for you um, in the parks to make them equitable for our for all. You know things things that weren't available ten years ago. Yeah. So what we're trying to do, which is great because it's really the industry that's moving this along, is we're trying to move from a model of ADA compliance to universal accessibility. And you know, Boston has a very strong senior population that's growing every day. We also have a great, vibrant young population every day. And the park has to relate to both those 
those populations. So when you look at it, you know, something as simple as the grading of the pathways right. and how easy it is to navigate, um, the outdoor exercise equipment, can people uh, with different abilities and different body types access that, that outdoor exercise equipment? That might be the only gym that that person is able to use. And then we want to make sure that a kid, regardless of their abilities, whether they're on the autism spectrum or whether they have mobility issues, they have a meaningful experience when they get to that park. And not just the one swing tucked in the side anymore. We want to make sure that they can interact with most of the things in the park. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to move towards a universal access method. And that's a new message. That's oh, it's very different. Me. It's yeah. very different. And it, it requires a lot of planning, a lot of design, and a lot of communication um, with the community as we go into as we go into design in these in these um, these parks. But it's enormously valuable. Um, for the kid to have uh, sort of a, a welcoming feeling when they enter a park as opposed to try to find the one or two things that might be for them. Children's Park in Roxbury, that's a new park. It's a, so new, it's a new park. It's a, well, it's a, it's a rehabilitated park, but it might as well be a new park because we doubled the size of it. And this was just an extraordinary uh, collaboration between multiple city departments. And I got to tell you, it's, it's something that can happen. One of the first things that Mayor Walsh uh, directed all of us to do is you know, to get out of our silos and start working together collaboratively. Well, collaborations take a lot of work and they take a lot of time, but when you see the results, so you look at a place like Children's Park in Roxbury. It was on the backside of the Lila G. Frederick, um, which has uh, level four inclusion. So kids with severe uh, mobility issues, kids um, that are affected by autism, but they had no access to a playground. In fact, they would go on field trips over to the Spalding Rehab to go over to their accessible park. And that was almost a 30 minute ride. Yeah. And there was a playground right behind them that they couldn't use. So we were able to work with the school department. We took down the fence. Uh, we created an entrance into the park. We filled it with uh, accessible play equipment. It's used every day, not just by the Frederick, but also the people in the neighborhood. But then in addition to that, we partnered with the Department of Neighborhood Development that owned a vacant lot in a, in a burned out uh, building right next door. We were able to expand the park, which gave us the grading so that we could have more accessible play value in the park. So Department of Neighborhood Development, the school department, and Boston Parks Department, all working together with the community and it resulted in a place that all kids are welcome. Sounds like something you can be proud of. Uh, we're, we're very, yeah. very proud of it. Great. I just, just visited it today, and it's been open for two months, and it looks outstanding. Awesome. I'm hearing rumors about another new park um, adjacent to the Children's Museum mm -hmm. called Martin's Park. Martin's Park, 64 Sleeper Street. Uh, it's a very unique site. Um, anyone who's visited the Children's Museum is probably familiar with it. It's a patch of green that's next to the Children's Museum. Um, in about a year, they, they won't recognize the spot. It's going to look absolutely amazing. It's going to be unlike anything that we have in the city of Boston. It's going to add a verdant bucolic landscape along the Four Point Channel um, that everyone will instantly uh, recognize um, as the park. Uh, we actually think it's an elevation of design that, that Boston hasn't really seen in its playgrounds. Michael Van Valkenburg is the landscape architect on the project. He designed Maggie Daly Park in Chicago, Brooklyn Bridge Park down in New York. We're very, very excited about it. Obviously, it's going to get a ton of usage given the proximity to yeah. the Children's Museum, but also the growing seaport in downtown populations. And those are, those are families that have really young kids, and they, they don't have a lot of tot lots. So it's going to be a great neighborhood park, and obviously it's named in honor of uh, Martin Richard, who was the, the youngest victim of the marathon bombings. Uh, so we're very, very proud to partner with the Richard family, uh, and this is something that's really going to be a gift for all Bostonians. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, summertime, I mm -hmm. bet that brings its own unique set of challenges for you. There's a lot more people in the park, mm -hmm. for one. Um, School-age kids are not in school. They're, they're hanging, looking for something to do. Perhaps the homeless population is a little more um, apparent out on the in the parks. So yeah, I mean, what so do you do? It, well, you know, summer summer in the parks that's that's our busy season, and that, and that's what you prepare all year for. Um, so as far as the positive activity that happens, I mean, just this year alone, we have 800 free events between our external relations programming, free concerts, and everything that's uh, put on by uh, Ryan Woods and the great team over there, but also the. Um, the uh, recreation division that provides different sports programming. And what we find is that if you give kids uh, an active uh, place to engage uh, with these green spaces, it pushes out negative activities. So we try to program as much as we can. But summer's definitely busy. 
um, but there's no point of a park if people aren't in it. So they, yeah. you know, there, there, there's what makes great parks is the people that use it and the people that surround it. And then fall, there must be a different set of challenges then. <laughs> there, there, there is. I mean, the, the, the change of the seasons, it, it's interesting. One of our busiest permitting months, so you wouldn't think it, is actually October. October is one of our busiest uh, months for uh, permitted activities in parks. And, you know, maybe it's just everyone trying to sneak it in before the snow <laughs> starts to fly. I think but, there's some truth to that. Uh, it, it, gets, it gets very busy, but also with the change of the season, uh, we try to get as many of the leaves uh, as possible before they freeze over because it's much harder to get them in the spring, and you sure. never know when it's going to thaw. You can come to my house and yeah, we, take we, care of my no, we gotta, we got to stay on our property. <laughs> don't do trust, that yet. trust me, we're very busy on our properties. <laughs> but, um, but again, we really got to reach out to the people that surround these parks and be very grateful to them. I can't tell you the countless amounts of friends groups that actually do the leaf pickup themselves and yeah. they'll do you know and we're more than happy to assist with that if someone wants to clean up a park if someone wants to assist us uh, with an activity and have a, a park a, a volunteer group you know they can we'll provide them the bags we'll provide them some of the tools and we'll come back later and and take the mess away after they're done uh, working hard on it um, it's really these partnerships around parks that make them great well, speaking of parks and tremendous parks, um, the Emerald Necklace. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could do a show alone on just the Emerald Necklace um, and its history and how it came to be. But um, maybe speak a little bit about your, the challenges you may face today with this park that sure. was completed over 100 years ago, but is obviously very relevant to us today. Oh, it's enormously relevant to us. I mean, it's interesting when you look at the history of the Emerald Necklace, um, and the, why, why Olmsted and the Olmsted Corporation were actually contracted by the, the Parks Commission of the City of Boston, it was to offset some of the pressures of a period of rapid growth and development in the City of Boston. They were trying to add open space so people could literally go and recreate Slow things themselves. Down a little. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and also, there was also a huge uh, stormwater benefit with the, the project of the, at the Muddy River and, and how much flooding used to happen there. So. A lot of those problems are the same problems that we face today. And so that means that these parks, which was an extraordinary amount of foresight um, by those folks over 100 years ago, as you said, they, they need to be relevant to these populations that are coming today. And so that means programming and that means maintenance. So there's more people enjoying these parks than ever which means we have to maintain them at a much higher level. And we do that in partnership in the Emerald Necklace with the Emerald Necklace uh, Conservancy, mm -hmm. as well as uh, other partner groups throughout the Necklace Franklin Park Coalition, Jamaica Pond Association. Without those groups, um, it, would, it would be hard to imagine the state of neglect that the necklace would be in. And it, it's, it's just beautiful right now. I find the people who do um, donate their time and energies um, to help uh, are very passionate about they the, are the subject so they're just they're very happy to donate what they donate so they are but we're really grateful to have them too but they are very happy to do it uh, and you have to be happy listen most people don't like weeding you know most people don't <laughs> like don't. invasive species <laughs> removal uh, the people who do like it are very passionate for it and if we didn't have them our parks would look a lot yeah. different well I'm a huge fan of Millennium Park mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's stunning I, I've gone walking and running and sure. when, you, when you get to the out the outside paths, you, f you feel like you're a world away. Mm -hmm. You know, you can hear wildlife, it's quiet, it's, um, it's just amazing. So for our viewers who are maybe new to the city, can you give just a little history about how that park came to be? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, it, w it, was, it was an extraordinary project that the city undertook in partnership with multiple agencies, you know, federal, state agencies. But basically that was the Gardner Street dump, you yeah. know, for, for years and it was, in a terrible location for a dump. It was right behind a high school complex, you know? Yeah. And uh, in the high school, the athletic complex was also in a state of disarray. Um, so now when you go there in West Roxbury, it's, it's, it's one of our premier recreational fields. Yeah. And in addition to that, there's this whole natural component that you mentioned that you really do feel like you're away from the city. I mean, it, the, the park shape is largely defined by the flow of the Charles River. I mean, it's yeah. just an incredibly yeah. beautiful landscape. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have dedicated staff out there. Uh, Sean and Chris are the two guys that are out at Millennium Park, and they work hard every day to All right, make I'll sure it looks good. I'll look for Sean and Chris and say hi. Sure. I think if you don't, even if you don't live in that neighborhood, you have to take a drive there. Oh, it's a real destination. It it's hard to yep. believe that a place like that exists in a city that's as yeah. densely populated yeah. as Boston. West Roxbury has some of uh, the city's largest open spaces available. Yeah, we do. We have Allendale Woods, which is our largest urban wild. Um, that's an amazing place. It actually has one of our few waterfalls. 
oh. in the spring. Oh. So it's really it's really a special place. But yeah, no, they're they're very lucky out there. It's also the the neighborhood with the the highest tree canopy as well. So are you gonna let me know which park is your favorite? Yeah, I mean it's it's <laughs> it's not a trick question oh, because okay. I, I I you know I I might get criticism uh, from other friends groups, but I've always had a special place in my heart for Christopher Columbus Waterfront Park in the North End. Um, again, that's another park that looks beautiful because of the friends group that's there, uh, the Friends of Christopher Columbus Park. But it literally has everything, especially when my kids were little, or, or littler than they are now. I mean, we could go there, they had they had boats, they had a taut mm -hmm. lot, they always have concerts, they always have special event activities. It has a great lawn, it has a splash pad. It has downtown Boston as one backdrop. It has Boston Harbor as the other backdrop. Um, and it's just a great space. Well, I hope you have enough time to enjoy the fruits of your labor to go some of the concerts and the, the um, puppet shows and um, the movies we do. that are I, available. We, 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 we spend most of our weekends going to parks good, in my good. household. We're very fortunate. And come fortunate. back and see us again. So I will, please, anytime you a want pleasure. me. Wonderful speaking with you. And um, thank you very much. Thank you very right. much. And we thank you, our viewers, for joining us. Much more information is available online at boston.gov parks. Here you can search for your neighborhood park, apply for a permit to hold an event or even a wedding in a park, or how you might donate your time or money to support our community's outdoor spaces. I'm Lois Leonard, and thank you for watching Commissioner's Corner.